Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Ether is the perfect drug for Las Vegas. In this town, they love a drunk. Fresh meat. Come on, boy. So they put us through the turnstiles and turned us loose inside. Welcome to another episode of Dose of Ether. Bijan is at the Crypto Invest Summit interviewing exciting entrepreneurs in the space, and this week we focus on entrepreneurs in the investment space. Next up is Voltaru, where you get to exchange Bitcoin for allocated gold, and you have legal rights over the gold that you trade on this exchange. Next up is BitIRA, that allows you to have pre-tax investment in crypto products. And last up is Black Moon, a tokenized hedge fund security token. I'm here with Joshua from Voltoro, and we're going to talk about tokenization, their platform, um, and what's next for crypto. So I'll let you give give the 30-second pitch. What What is your company, Voltoro? What do you do, and, and where are you now today? So we've been, we're an exchange um, that trades between Bitcoin and physical allocated gold. And so like any exchange, Kraken, Bitstamp, any of those, uh, except we deal with allocated gold. And why that's important is that if we as an exchange, if anything ever happens to us, our, the, our client's gold is not on our books. So liquidators can't come in and take our client's assets. Mm, how does that work? Um, because gold is a physical good. It's just sitting in a vault in your name as your legal property and it's fully audited and fully insured. And this is important. You don't want to trust startups with your money. And this is what I learned when I, I lost a lot of money in that Gox, so did you. And, and so it, there's a lot of us that deal with how, what the hell exchanges do with our money and how, how to mitigate that. And this all goes also to the banking sector, right? The banking sector is so intransparent, they, they, they're hypothecating money left, right and center and trading it like crazy. So I mean, so there's no doubt that people have lost trust in the institutions, yeah. both government and corporate. You know, we have mega monopolies that steal our data and use it to enrich themselves and we're we're not cool with that as much as we used to yeah. and so there's a lot of uncertainty and and uh, fear around this space for that reason and and with gold gold is supposed to be that thing that gets you out of the monetary system not entrenches you in and and we know in the past in the 70s when we went off the gold standard that the government actually confiscated gold so yeah. i think the approach out out of Mount Gox that, that the community has taken is let's get to decentralized exchange. That's Absolutely. the way to solve the problem in yes, their view. I agree. Now, that's all well and good, but in the meantime, when we don't have the liquidity or usability for those systems, we yeah. have to do better than Mount Gox. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, as soon as Mount Gox collapsed, I was talking um, to my brother and saying, hey, let's build a decentralized exchange. I'm just so over it. So we actually started working on that back uh, back then, but the op return codes were the programming language behind the crypto, and there wasn't Ethereum at the time, there wasn't anything else, it was pretty much Bitcoin. Right, at that time it was coin. like col colored coins, yeah, and colored those were the only things you could really do. Exactly, so we, we decided, hey, let's focus on a centralized exchange that can be ultimately transparent using blockchain tech. And so that's what we focus on, say, hey, there's a centralized exchange, but let's make it truly transparent. Let's give everyone an anonymous ID that they can use and they log out of our system and we print every anonymous ID and how much Bitcoin that's got so they can check it without us knowing that, we're, that they're checking. And so we can't fiddle with those numbers and they can sum up everybody's how do you not? Fit, how are you not able to fiddle with those numbers? Because we don't know that someone's checking. So someone could check at any time and say, see that. And then they can sum up. So they can verify on their own systems and what their balance is versus the right. transaction history that you're publishing. Exactly. So even though it's you're controlling that ledger, it's not yeah. a blockchain ledger, no. but you're kept honest because the consumer can validate it themselves. At any time. And then they can see the sum of everyone's holdings and compare that to so they can Cold see wallets. your solvency as an organization. Exactly. And by not having custody of the gold yourself, what's the risk factor that you're mitigating there? Well, on the on the crypto side, they can verify how much crypto the exchange has got by checking our cold wallets because we publish them. Mm -hmm. And then on the gold side, we publish the the vault certificates, the um, the the statements that the vault provider releases. 
Um, the auditing certificates from BDO International, they're the, one of the largest auditors in the world, and the insurance paperwork. So this is something where everyone can verify stuff by themselves. And, and so how does this different from like, you know, Peter Schiff always talks about gold. Yeah. And how you gotta buy gold. Right. What is he, what is, what is his service offering uh, and how does that compare to Voltoro? So basically, you can buy some gold with crypto, uh, with gold money, but the thing is that you can't get money, you can't get crypto back for that gold. And you can only buy gold in a certain vault in Dubai, I think, or one vault. So the, the problem is, if you've got it in there, then you have to get it out as fiat. But the other problem is, it's an OTC exchange. So if you bought a whole heap of, if you have a massive position with them, and, they, and then you want to trade back out, they could set their price potentially really high, and you're forced to pay that. So, so they are the price setter. It's not a, an market. open market for, exactly. of price for gold. Yeah, it's when not it's a in one of those discovery vaults. system. And this is also one, one of but the But you could sell your shares in that gold. Or is um, that, does that not, is there no secondary market like there's that? There's no secondary market for them um, at all. And, and, and so our, the key for us as well is I wanted to really find a price discovery system for Bitcoin that was outside of fiat. I got into crypto to get away from fiat. Why are we pricing everything in fiat? And I saw that um, uh, uh, Samurai Wallet just took off fiat, uh, pricing stuff in fiat recently, to say, no, let's start pricing stuff in Bitcoin. Wow. And that's, that's really a bold step. And uh, we want to allow people to still have some sort of unit of account based on gold or something else that's not part of the establishment. Uh, gold and so you would view stable coins algorithmically backed or physically backed if they're trading against the US dollar that that's somehow a bad thing? Look, the stable coins based on a fiat are ridiculous because for instance, I'm going to pick on Tether, they're not the only ones, but they're all the same. Even if Tether has all the money there, let's say they do, then that bank that's holding that, there's two bank accounts holding $2.8 billion of theirs, right? Apparently. Even if that's true, the bank is only, that's in a Malaysian bank, they have to uh, have 5% reserve. So that means they're speculating with 95% of that money. And on the other side, the tether is also speculating. So you've got two things speculating like crazy. On top of that, if a bad actor has some tether and buys something uh, illegal on a black market, they get busted, the police or the government says, hey, what's that? Where's the bank account? Shut it down. They've just shut down the entire economy from one bad actor, right? So a gold-backed stablecoin would allow you to um, to have an allocation to a certain serial number bar, which means that private key belongs to that bar. That means if there's a bad actor in that space, the authorities can only take that one bar. They can't shut down because every other bar belongs to other people legally. So they can't shut down the entire economy. They can just confiscate one bar. And, and is, is there a, that's very interesting and, and thank you for clarifying that. It's a very clear way of putting it now. How does uh, an investor actually, can they redeem these certificates or digital certificates for actual gold in the United yeah. States? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's not certificate. certificate. You actually own that gold. It's your it's gold. It's almost hard to wrap my head around how that's true. Yeah. Because it's never been true, really. You've always had counterparty risk. And you still do here because there's somebody holding it in a vault somewhere. That's but right. it's not through a chain of intermediaries, at least. And it's you're actually trading the physical gold, not some derivative of And gold. it's not being speculated with. You know, it's just a block sitting there and fully insured. Not like the bank, the FDIC is only insured to 250K. So uh, if, if Taylor goes broke, they've got 250K. And so what's how, what's the entry point to, for Voltoro? How does a user onboard? Well, b basically we're crypto, uh, well asset based only. So we don't take any fiat. So you need to have crypto first. If you want to take some, uh, some profit off the table or you want to trade the, the gold price, um, you can go into Voltoro, you deposit some Bitcoin, and uh, in February we'll be launching other coins, um, uh, you know, the top 10, 15 solid blue chips. And, uh, and they then put an order in like anyone else and say, I want this many grams for this much. And if someone is willing to buy that uh, with some gold that they've got, or if their market maker decides that, then that, that order will be fulfilled. And, and, and then they can go back to crypto when, when they want to. Right. Um, Who's the target? It sounds like the target audience is obviously existing crypto investors. Why would crypto people who, you know, they, they don't like the fiat system, maybe yeah. they're, they're ideologically bent toward that, maybe they're a bigger fan of gold, but do you see these consumers really wanting exposure to gold and why? 
Because gold is a true asset, it's found into existence. It's a it's a rare it's a rare metal, and Bitcoin is a rare number. They, they're very they're very similar aligned. I mean, Satoshi really is built a mathematical model of gold when he built Bitcoin, and and so Bitcoiners generally they understand gold, and they understand that it's an asset that they own. It's not some some weird derivative, and they can get it sent out to them if they want. They can go pick it up if they want. Um, and it's fully insured. So this is much better than trusting a bank account when that Mt. Gox collapsed, right? And people that held fiat on Mt. Gox, not only did they not own that fiat, but the bank owns that fiat. So you, liquidators just come in and just start eating away all that money. And so by, by investing in some gold instead, um, it's it's off of our books. It's nothing to do with. So you're a service provider, matchmaking and facilitating, and, and making sure that the consumer who desires to sell or buy the gold can yeah. do that without really trusting you once it's done. Yeah, they that's can right. get they can have their gold. They can trade it as they wish, and there aren't as many restrictions around the sale of it that there there might be otherwise. Exactly. The KYC is a lot less. Um, this sort of thing because. You're buying a physical good. It's like when you go and buy a television, you don't need to show KYC for a television, right? I mean, we take KYC nowadays because it's allocated to yourself. And we had one client uh, pass away, and the the uh, the, um, the estate the estate Planners management needed, yeah, needed yeah. to know where that, and that's assigned to an email address. And it was a bit hard to so. Oh wow! We thought, well, look, let's solve people, this. Yeah. And people actually wanted it. People said thanks. I, I really like that. And it was quite interesting for me that they actually didn't mind passing some information on and. And so it makes it easier for account verification if someone loses their ID. Their, their so I, I, I think the product sounds great. I think we need this kind of vision in the cryptocurrency space of a proponent of moving us off of centralized exchanges, especially if you've been burned and you know how deep the problem is in the space. Even today with some really great companies, like Coinbase is a good company, yeah. a strong company, sure. but even even that is an issue. Even having yeah. Coinbase as a centralized exchange, yeah. uh, facilitating all those transactions for the blockchain where we really we meant to get on you know, yeah. all this stuff into a, a, a blockchain. Not. So, but I want to talk about gold for a second. Now, yeah. there's a lot of speculation that happens around gold today and historically and some think that gold price is being effectively suppressed by um, market by, by powerful market uh, agents all around the world do yeah. you believe that this well I mean the, idea the concept like, what, what, of a what gold should... spot price has always been weird to me how can you have a spot price locked in twice a day in a true global free market that seems weird to me and and it's true. And sometimes on Voltoro, it will drop below spot, and then we'll sometimes we'll go above spot because people are actually trading this thing of what the market decides. So yeah, I mean, it can be a little bit manipulated, sure, but it's le it's definitely less manipulated than the currency markets. I feel that they're really manipulated because they just they can just print this stuff, helicopter money, whatever they want. The FX markets are uh, really manipulated. I mean, you have these uh, these people that are employed by. Black ops and stuff to actually, you know, destroy economies of, of developing countries. They'll go in there and just say, right, they're, they're oil rich. We're going to go in there and just just an economic hitman. They call right, it, you know? and and that's what George Soros did, and he built his career around that. He built his career, and he around. did that against the Bank of England, <laughs> amazingly. <laughs> Absolutely, what a, amazing. what, a, what an amazing uh, yeah, character. Story, For, yeah. what, whether you like him or hate him, I mean, incredible, it, yeah. incredible things. Right. Um, so I mean, talk about manipulation, and and gold is this decentralized thing, right? You, you don't have there's no central issuer people are mining and discovering gold all around the world it's a rare resource there's only a tennis court squared so if you imagine a block on a tennis court that's the only amount of gold that's on above ground wow you know it's really not much that's crazy and and, and here's you know in the crypto space we talk about getting off of fiat and one of the biggest detractors is the volatility right yeah, and yeah. if i'm holding all of my assets in a highly volatile asset class, then I'm exposed to a hell of a lot of risk, especially yeah. when I need that cash flow. That's and so is this a way to um, move your assets to a safer, more secure asset class without getting some of that exposure to volatility? Absolutely. While keeping the, the that, that risk of, of uh, counterparty risk at bay. You and know? do you see this gold-backed token 
being used in place of something like a tether in the future? Is that a possibility? That's my hope. The problem is that I think will still arise is that people will still, they still price things in USD. They still got the mindset. They don't have the mindset of pricing crypto in grams. Uh, right. of gold, of but, gold yeah. but this takes a while right it just takes a while and what do you think is the natural counting mechanism once 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 let's say in the future usd yeah. destabilizes and one bitcoin is actually worth a million us dollars but you don't want us dollars yeah what in that in that case what is the unit of account i mean it it, it could be bitcoin right it could be bitcoin but i think we're seeing now a huge amount of tokens arising and with the whole ico thing and we're, we're seeing that's not going to go away the, the fact that we now have tokenization of things and company stocks or utilities within companies, we're going to have you know Uber tokens and you're paying that and you've been <coughs> but the ar the argument that. is that the reason that these tokens are being used as a store of value today and they are because their people are storing value in them they have yeah. value yeah. you can sell them and so they're they're putting it into these Uber coins and whatever shit coin that's yeah. out there today yeah. Yeah. and they're keeping it there because either they lose access to their private key or they don't have the liquidity to change from one token to the next yeah. the question that's interesting from a philosophical standpoint is where does the store of value accrete does it go all to Bitcoin? Is it a winner-take-all market? Mm. Once you do have sound money, mm. is gold even competitive? Is Ethereum or anything else competitive when you have that single single store of value that is a unit of account and can be used as a medium of exchange between thousands of different tokens without any uh, uh, overhead? Well, I mean, I, I was a Bitcoin maximalist from day one. I mean, been in this from $1. I, I've, I've been obsessed by Bitcoin, right? But what I've realized is that competition maximalism really is is where it's at. And the fact of the matter is that we will have different tokens, different currencies. We're seeing that Litecoin is more popular in Malaysia. We're seeing that Dash is starting to get a grip in Venezuela. We're seeing that Bitcoin is solid in America and Europe. And, and these these markets start to gravitate to certain things depending on network effects. So there's no, I don't, I, you know, entropy in the world is all about uh, I, I don't see it consolidating to one, especially when certain currencies get, have more of an up, upswing potential. That's why I think we'll see maybe like a top 10 solid ones that might be used for a unit of account in certain geographical regions, but then we'll uh, be able to atomically swap between them all very simply. Uh, and, and when you know you can use Uber tokens or some shitcoin to pay the Uber driver where he's actually being paid in a token for the company that he works at and is invested in the company that he works in, uh, I think that, that that opens up a whole world of imagination, right? I used to think that Bitcoin is changing money, but really what's changing money is, is tokenized assets, tokenized things, uh, companies being able to build these utility tokens. I see that as, as, as groundbreaking. And now the fact that people, it, it, it makes it that stocks and shares become a medium of exchange for the first time. It's, it's, an, it's an insane thing. And when you, the deeper you go on Bitcoin, the more you expand your understanding of how it could impact the world. Yeah. And here's where I see a lot of the issues with the current narrative. Um, the narrative shifts constantly, right? For a lot of 2018, it was anti-Ethereum. Ethereum is never going to retain value because yeah. it's useless and you're never going to solve the Oracle problem and da 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 Bitcoin is the shit. Bitcoin is everything. Bitcoin yeah. or bust. Yeah. And, and my problem with that is exactly what you're saying is competition is actually useful here. Yeah. We're, we're all underdogs. Yeah. Every cryptocurrency is an underdog to, to gold and fiat, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that two thirds of global fiat currencies are less stable maybe than, than Bitcoin and people might be better off with a cryptocurrency alternative. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you 100% that the in, encouraging and fostering competition is what will get us to that next 100 million consumers and making it easier for it to be done in a regulated uh, 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 environment or uh, in a fully decentralized way. All of these technology improvements are pushing us more toward global adoption, which is a good yeah. thing. The thing that I love about Bitcoin maximalists is that they keep the the, the conversation focused yeah. on sound money, yes. and that is really critically important, and that's what's going to bring fiat into crypto. But what Ethereum and these other cryptocurrencies, layer one blockchains are doing, they're competing for different markets. Like Ethereum doesn't care to become sound money, and maybe you would argue that there will only be one, 
But the problem with that is it took us 300 years to develop discounted cash flow and medium of exchange formulas that were Nobel Prize winning accomplishments mm. right. and people think nine years in that they've figured it out. Mm. Don't you think that's naive? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and really seeing it from, the fact of the matter is Bitcoin is gonna stick around. It has a massive network effect. It, when, whenever I tell anyone to, when they're get, first getting a crypto, what should I buy? I just say, just Bitcoin. Stick with BTC you'll be all right. Yeah, there might not be the massive upswings. I mean, I think there still will be, actually. But there might not be. But it's a solid bet because it's that you have the best developers in the world. But the fact of the matter is you have these little experiments and to call them all scams is, I think, mis is wrong. Of course, there's scams in there. There's plenty of, plenty of scams. But the fact of the matter is there's a difference between testing economic theory uh, with a weird concept like Steemit, for instance, it, it's it's wacky it's wacky economic theory it's all out of whack and, and you could see it as a scam but you could see it as a test and let's see i mean it's voluntary you're not forced to use it so let's see if it works see if it runs and yeah you know i, I can understand that some people would be angry where like maybe dan Laram got very rich off of something that didn't work but at the end of the day it's it's testing economic theory no one's forcing you to do this stuff and i think the market is getting more and more educated we have been far too protected by regulation um, uh, in the past that, that we see all these people getting burnt by scams because they don't know what to look out for. They don't know what, what to, uh, how do you check again? I love that because you're putting the onus on the government now to make, to take action, to enable investors, retail investors who want to yeah. get exposed to some kind of upside rather than protecting them by cutting them out of the market. Why not protect them by educating them? Absolutely. Education is key. The, the more we regulate, the more we're basically siloing the, uh, the the in, the entire banking section in, and, and allowing them to control the space again, instead of the startups being able to come and, and bootstrap themselves because they don't need to uh, deal with this massive overhead of, of regulatory burden, that, and that's really why Bitcoin has strived and how Bitcoin's been able to and crypto in general has been able to expand in such an amazing way because they're testing all these different grounds because it's unregulated. And I think that's uh, the, the, the difference that a lot of investors in this space are not really cognizant of is how experimental fundamentally 95% of these projects are, even if they're solid, solid team, solid product, community that's great. It's yeah. still experimental. We don't know the token mechanism designs that are going to accrete value over time. We don't know how um, hacks in, in security tokens are going to affect um, liquidity solvency and fees and all this other stuff. Like, yeah. it's really hard to predict. And if you shut yourself off from thinking that there is a there, there, that it's possible to solve usability, oracles, or any of these other decentralized exchanges, if you think they can't be solved, then you never would have seen Bitcoin come in the first place. Yeah. You never would have seen the power and opportunity it creates. Um, and don't, I, I, it's so strange to me that people who got onboarded into this community could think that things like like Oracle problem or any of these problems are not solvable, yeah. given that we solved what's potentially the hardest of all is getting sound money in, a, in a, a zero competition environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one guy supposedly did that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's strange to me to think that, that we're not going to fix a lot of these critical issues. Well, you know, I, it, it's true. When I... Uh, in, in, in 2000, I was working in digital currency and trying to develop a digital currency uh, for, for a swap site. I developed the world's first swap site back then and where people were swapping clothes. And, and I realized it was a shitty system, right? Because deals fall through all the time. You have a great t-shirt, but you'd like nothing of mine. Deal falls through, hey, hey I need to build a token. And I, but I didn't want to issue the token because the issuance then creates a nightmare. What, what, how many do I issue? You get into, so I wanted to develop a decentralized system. Of course I couldn't. I was too naive uh, and realized the double spend problem. I, I studied it for like three years, wow. couldn't solve it. And I thought, it's unsolvable. Move on, Josh. Move on. And that, well, you're probably right to move on because you may yeah. not have gotten there. No, I, I, well, I definitely wouldn't have. And, and uh, you know, when Satoshi's white paper came across my table uh, in 2010, I, I fell down that rabbit hole and thought, wow, she solved the problem. This is fantastic. And, and you know, now we can really get on with with changing the world from from the economic system but but from a grassroots for the first time the grassroots can can rise up yeah. in, a, in a financial and i'm sense. not worried about people not seeing the light they will it, it'll yeah. it'll come faster than you think and 
my mother didn't let me buy something on eBay with yeah. her credit card because she thought, what's eBay? What, yeah. You're going to give your money to somebody over the internet? It's yeah. going to get my credit card stolen. Yeah. And and look now, like she's using Facebook and eBay all the time, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and it's it this, this kind of thing takes time and, and the patient will win and the builders who want to be a part of this, who want to be a rising boat, you know, it, with those tides should get involved now because it's exactly the right time. Absolutely. You know, if we look at the Dow Jones, if you look at that spike, uh, I was telling someone before, that it looks like a Bitcoin bubble. It's like this huge spike. I mean, the thing is going to pop. We, we're seeing all the pointers in this system that people have to buy some sort of alternative assets, whether that's property, gold, Bitcoin, forestry, something that's solid, something that's outside of the system, um, because something's going to happen and this is going to force people to start taking this thing seriously. There's going to be, there is collapse. going to be massive change and better to be prepared and diversified than not. Absolutely, because once it pops, you don't have the money anymore. And this is what we saw in Greece. People were telling people in Greece, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. Greece popped, where they went down, um, they couldn't buy it. Their, their banks were shut. And that's the same in Cyprus. And so these people in Cyprus as well, they're very open to Bitcoin. Now. They're like, wow, I'm, I'm definitely getting ready. And, yeah. um, and, and historically, fiat currencies always fail. 27 years is the average lifespan. Of it's just a matter of time. So even if you think you're safe, even if you think you're, you know, part of the world reserve currency and that your military prowess is going to lead you to riches and the exploitation of smaller companies, countries forever, it's just not true. America's a great country, by the way. I love America. Big, America's big a patriot. great country. I uh, love uh, the people But of the thing is, we think of this typically as a competitive market the most free country on earth we love to think of it that way yeah. but there is no freedom with money there is no com competition with interest rates no that's right i mean there is globally but there isn't locally and and money look we, we're all talking about free markets and free you know we're capitalist countries and at the end of the day our money is monopolized and that is the that's the kingpin of a free market is the money. And the money is the liquidity within this so-called free market. How can you have a true free market if the money's monopolized? And we the question is, how much bigger would the economy be if it wasn't held back by this? Uh, exactly. It would be absolutely mammoth. So on that note, we encourage our listeners to uh, go to Voltoro. Uh, check out what Josh and his team are doing. Really cool stuff. Where, what's the website? It's Voltoro, so that's Volt, like a like a gold vault, not a bank vault. Uh, v a u l t o r o <laughs> yeah. dot com. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. All right. And uh, on Twitter as well, I'm always tweeting stuff uh, about economic theory and about gold and. Tips I'll be sure trading. to argue with you there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> good, it good chatting with you. Thanks. Nice. All right, we are here with Jay from BitIRA, and we're going to learn about how you can use your retirement funds to buy Bitcoin. Basically, yeah. Bitcoin uh, and, and a few other tokens. Before. And, and why, <laughs> why has this never been possible before? Ultimately, technology evolves over a period of time. Um, assets availability in retirement accounts have changed over the years. Um, obviously, you know, the industry is dominated by some major players, Fidelity, Vanguard, Edward Jones. These are big companies. They're not the most responsive to technical change. Um, they know what they do. They know what they do well. So it's, it's companies like ours that are kind of pushing the frontier and helping people do this in a safe, secure manner that fulfills all the requirements that the IRS is put in place to safeguard your retirement accounts. So everybody tells, you know, consumers, retail investors in the space, either don't put your money in crypto, or if you are, put it as a very small percentage of your assets. Um, and, you know, a lot of people don't really know how they, how much flexibility they have in their mm -hmm. 401ks and IRAs, and don't really have the excess cash to be investing their hard-earned money into crypto. So how does BitIRA kind of help with this space where it is today? So. That's a great question. Ultimately, when you have a 401k, what a lot of people don't really realize, that's your money. You know, you could do with it as much or as little as you want. If you're, if you're really, really uh, bullish on crypto, you should take some of that money, if it's in an IRA or 401k, we move it into a, a cryptocurrency-enabled IRA. You can put as much or as little as you want 
um, essentially into the choices of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Stellar, Ripple, Zcash, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic. And you can buy when you want, you can sell when you want. Ultimately, I, I say to people, number one, get educated, know what you're doing. But number two, once you are and you want to make a move, it's your money. Do what you want with it, you know? And and how does it work? So like, I know today if I have an, employ you know, an employer with a 401k program, maybe they're going to match it, maybe they're not. But I'm going to get some tax advantage um, investments by, by putting a part of my income every month or every deposit mm -hmm. into this 401k or IRA. Now, how... Where does it go from here? My money's in Vanguard. Where, where do I go from here? If your money's in Vanguard, if it's an IRA, you give me a call. You say, my money's in Vanguard. I say, not a problem. You pick up the phone. It must, it must be ringing off the hook. We get a lot of calls. We have a lot of people working for us. We're a pretty big company. Um, and yeah, I'll assign you an agent. They will call Vanguard with you on the phone. They'll say, we have someone on the line. This is what they're looking to do. We prepare paperwork for you that we send to you. You check it, make sure that it, it has all the details correct. If you like what you see, you sign it off. We do all the work behind in the background, get the funds moved across. They come across as cash. They're gonna sit in a cash position in your new retirement account. And then you decide when you buy, you decide when you sell. It's literally as ordering, as easy as, how my generation well, used to I, order a pizza. You I know? Gotcha. We yeah, still yeah. had to pick up the phone, but then someone else did the work for us. So one day we'll be able to get P our, our uh, Bitcoin through our IRA from our, from an app, but until then, you still have to use the phone, which is fine. You know, which friendly is... people. It's not it's not robots, right? Exactly. It's, it's right. everyone. We're based out of California. Well, it's we're already over. ninety percent <laughs> better than most banks. So That's so, what but we do. here's the question though: Do I have to transfer all of my money into crypto? No, absolutely. Um, you're fully in control. So. If you have a 401k so that's eligible. So I can still eligible. use my Vanguard index funds if I like them. Absolutely. You take the portion. put a part of it in Bitcoin. What if I want to use the Bitcoin to buy coffee or a pizza? So remember that anything that's in inside of an IRA has to be liquidated before you pull it out. Mm. So, and that, that is one incurs taxation. However, with a Bitcoin IRA account, you can actually turn around, say it's time to retire, say Bitcoin's utility has gone through the roof, you're not ready to sell it. You can say, Jay, I want Bitcoin out of my retirement account, here's my wallet address. We'll send you your Bitcoin. So you don't have to liquidate to take it out. And then once it's in your wallet, you can do whatever you want with it. Well, I'm sure all of our listeners are intrigued and they're going to sign up at bitira.com, I'm guessing. Uh, exactly, yeah. bitira.com. Um, so let's talk about the, the backside of this. How do you actually acquire the cryptocurrencies? Are you holding them yourself or yourselves or are you uh, using a, const a custodian service to handle that part? So another great question. For any retirement account, there has to be a custodian. So the great thing about working with retirement accounts is a lot of people are kind of intimidated intimidated by regulation they think regulation is a bad thing regulation's a pretty good thing when it's protecting your money that's what i'll throw out there um, obviously inside of an ira all assets are held by a custodian so what happens is the custodian they literally control the assets, they write statements for you, it's like logging into your bank and who account. is the custodian So this? we work with a custodian based out of Nevada called the Preferred Trust Company. They, we have a wallet provider that we work with for Bitcoin, for example, at Zappa. Wall Street Journal uh, described them as the Fort Knox of institutional Bitcoin storage. Um, and, and these guys are federally regulated and, and insured? Absolutely. So let me... All IRA custodians have to be registered with the IRS. They're regulated by the IRS. Uh, you didn't need any kind of oversight to do what we did previously. We said that's not sufficient for our client safety. So we registered with uh, as a money services business with FINRA, which is a, department, uh, a part of the Department of the Treasury. Um, and yeah, there's all the normal retirement account regulation is still in place so, to, hold, so to take care of you. What's cool about this from a, an investor's perspective is now I can use my tax advantage account like a trading account. Yeah, and, and what's really good is... And, and, and further, by using, by using, by putting my money in today, uh, that I'm, I'm going to get, you know, savings and I'm mm -hmm. going to compound any interest on gains much more than I would if I were to buy it with my uh, post-tax dollars. It, well, exactly. That's, that's a great advantage. More than that, if you move from cryptocurrency to another token, capital gains could be incurred. At the end of the year, you settle your tax bill. That takes a bite out of your available capital. Now you've got fewer chips on the table and less to work with. 
when it's inside of an IRA, there are no capital gains generating events. You can Whoa. move between tokens. You so can... even though tokens are considered property by the IRS mm -hmm. and every transaction, how big, well, however big or small, is subject to capital gains and mm -hmm. the tracking of that, it's not the case here. Not inside of an IRA. Inside of so an IRA. So you only IRA, pay the taxes after the fact. Exactly. All taxes are deferred until uh, you take money out of an IRA. So you can literally build your capital. You, if you think a token is expensive and you want to move into cash, reinvest on the dips, outside of an IRA, you're worried about those short-term capital gains. Inside of an IRA, move into cash. So let's, in let's talk about the disadvantage. And the biggest one is that you don't have access to your capital anymore. So how, how can we, as investors in this space, fast-moving space, need to, let's say we need to make a move out of crypto very quickly. I assume BitRA is going to let me transfer that into cash. Mm -hmm. Love to talk about the time frame for that transition. If there is, let's say, a crash in the market and people mm -hmm. want to get out, uh, not saying that's advisable, but I'm sure there are a lot of people that will. Secondly, you know, how do I use some of this money if I want to? Is there a way to get a loan off of that or to extract some of the money and pay some fees so that I have access to my money before I'm 65? Which who knows how long that uh, will take. Yeah, so th there's it a couple count, of things. But, you know. uh, number one, it, the actual cutoff's 59 and a half. So once oh, you okay. turn 59 and a half, you can access capital inside a retirement account with no penalty. So we have plenty of, you know, plenty of people that um, are looking at this and, and they see the growth and they're thinking long term. Now remember that this capital is as accessible as any other retirement account capital. So if you've already got a 401k, if you've already got an IRA, it just has the limitations on those assets already. They exist regardless of whether or not it's cryptocurrency, equities, bonds, whatever you want to call it. But in this scenario, you can actually invest in something you're at least interested in. Um, that being said, if you there are ways that you can get money out of a retirement account before you're 59 and a half. There are some penalties that are incurred. The same as any other retirement account. It's always something you should discuss with your CPA or a tax advisor. We're not here to give tax advice. We're here to make things as simple as possible inside that retirement account. That's very, very interesting. And it's good. It's a good service that you're offering. Are you worried at all that companies like Fidelity will come into the space and use their brand and their image to um, kind of push you guys around? I mean, at some point in time, that's kind of what we're all hoping for. The mass adoption is going to be really, really good for everyone. Uh, I think there's always going to be a market for a service like ours, which is a lot more hands-on, a lot more service orientated. We, we help people in ways that the big players don't. We're much more nimble than the big players. I think we're always going to be able to offer something. That being said, the retirement industry is worth $27 trillion roughly. The day that Fidelity make this as easy as clicking a button and getting it like any other equity, you don't want to wait to that point to be on the space. The minute that $27 trillion worth of capital can buy this online, you want to be the guy that gets in before that point because this is a limited supply asset. By opening up potential demand, it's only going to be great basic economics. Wow. Well, I love that. Uh, check out BitIRA at BitIRA.com. Convert your IRAs to cryptocurrency today and get some of the benefits of uh, cryptocurrency and leave your active manager behind. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Jay. It was great to talk to you. Dijan, great talking with you. I'm here with Moshe from Black Moon, and we're going to talk about liquidity, security tokens, and their product, and how it differs from. Let's just get into it. Why? Why not Polymath? Why not Prime Trust? Why not Token IQ? Everybody's got a security token business these days. Right. ICOs are out of fashion. So tell me, why Black Moon? Uh, so the differentiator is that we're doing something that nobody else is doing in the sense that we're focused on tokenizing hedge funds. Uh, that is the core product offering that Black Moon provides. Um, so all the other security token issuing platforms are very much focused on corporate equity. So Bijan, tell me. I'm going to challenge you. Now. Okay. All right. We're going to do I'm a Q&A. I'm ready. I'm going to flip flip the, uh, the, the roles. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm okay with that. What's I like the, role playing. Right. What's, oh, I don't want to get into that one. Uh, what's the difference between hedge fund equity and corporate equity? 
I, does it count that you already asked me this question earlier? Am I allowed to answer honestly, or should I fake it? Like you gave it away. <laughs> you gave it away. I, I set you up to make you smart. I, it's hard for me to lie. I, I really have a problem <laughs> with that. So my the way I understand it is corporate equity is not really redeemable per se. Right. Is right. that what the difference? Yes, is? Yes, that's the difference. Is that hedge fund equity is redeemable back to the issuer. So when today when I invest into a hedge fund. They give me a fancy piece of paper that says I own equity in that fund. It, you know, you can call it I am a partner of that fund by it being an equity owner. But the difference between a hedge fund and stocks like Apple and Google and Microsoft, uh, just to name a few, is that taking my equity ownership in the hedge fund that I gave money into, I get to take that equity and give it back to the hedge fund and say, give me my money back as a function of my investment. And that redemption paradigm changes the whole nature of not only to my, as my relationship to the issuer and their responsibilities to me as an investor as it relates to reporting requirements. Of, but I can imagine that that would change things. I just don't know how as, a, as an investor that impacts me. Like, why do I care if I can go to a hedge fund and redeem it? I'm not going to go to a hedge fund and redeem anything. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it all online anyway. The, dif the difference, the main, there are a lot of differences, but the main difference is that when you talk about value, the fact that I can redeem equity means that I know two things that I can't get in corporate equity world. Number one, my equity has an intrinsic value because I know what it's worth at any point in time, regardless, it doesn't matter what's going on in the secondary marketplace. So corporate equity is forced to value itself via consensus. The consensus of the community trading that token in the open market. And the only valuation that the community can come to consensus on requires, and I'm just following you know, the traditional stock market model right now, I'm just defining it. It requires sell side research. It requires normalized reporting. For, towards analytics, because ultimately everything is relatively valued. So when you're when we look at the stock market, we see it as a voting machine. And right. The that's people, exactly what it is. The people who have or want shares vote on what the price is at any given time. Yes, but how do you get to the value proposition? How do you know something's undervalued or not? Just because somebody's willing to sell it to you or buy it from you, it doesn't mean that you know what is making my vote right and your vote wrong. And I, I can explain. What's the difference between Home Depot and Lowe's? As just as a simple a brand. basic example. The brand, so one has a fancier logo than the other. One is a cleaner store than the other. But technically, the revenue streams of those two businesses are very much correlated. And everyone knows it. If you look at the two prices of the stocks, they go up and down in sync with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to an extent. There's a, you know, we can call it an arbitrage. So, so by not having exposure to the day-to-day -day price fluctuations, how does that benefit me as, a, as Well, we're not there yet. The point is, is that even in the Home Depot Lowe's example, there's a normalized reporting requirement for publicly traded companies so that I can value Home Depot's versus Lowe's using their financial statements mm -hmm. to see how one company is doing in relation to one another. Would that be book value or their intrinsic value as a company? There is no intrinsic value sure. to corporate equity. But I didn't even realize that there was a standard process for valuing companies in this way because everybody, every investor has their own valuation framework and, and it took 300 years for us to develop discounted cash flows and all these other mechanisms for valuation. I don't think there is a consensus there, on what the valuation for a company should be, which is why it fluctuates, right? In that sense, you're half right and half absolutely wrong. Okay. Uh, the half right is related to the consensus part and the analytics. The part where it's completely wrong, regardless of intrinsic value, is the fact that publicly traded companies, by definition, are forced to report on their financials in a standardized format. So there are gap rules, for example, right? Globally accepted uh, accounting practices that allow us to look at a company and value it in relation to other companies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can argue back and forth in terms of what value does that bring, which effectively is the voting machine that you're talking about. But the basis of the analysis is based on a relative valuation that requires normalized practices. And, and corp private corporations don't need to publish this information. And, that, and that's the problem. 
that private corporations, it's private <laughs> by definition. Yeah. And even those private companies that are putting out information to their investors about how they're doing and what their revenues are, and they're being transparent, it's still not in a normalized fashion so that you know one accounting practices of one company and the accounting reporting practice of another company. So even if you had all the available information within every corp private corporation, you still wouldn't be able to compare them. Well, you could, you, but, maybe, but it takes a lot more effort at an industry level. Because they're not using necessarily gap That's correct. standards. So okay. when, when we're talking about, you know, let's go back to where we started from. When we're talking about the difference of a redeemable token versus a inflatably valued token, right, or, or stock, Right? Or, or corporate equity, corporate equity versus redeemable equity. That when we talk about in the intrinsic value of a redeemable equity, it comes down to the fact that I don't need to know reporting requirements, I don't need to know relative valuations, because technically speaking, it's asset-backed. Right? I know what the value of the underlyings are worth. I know what the hedge fund is worth based on the assets that it owns. Now. You can argue about the fractionalized value on an individual level, but my ownership in terms of what I purchased in that fund is a known value, known as right, NAV, but, the but, net asset value of the fund. But let's even take a look at the uh, fund example, and they are only valuing, they are only recalibrating valuations of their portfolio companies periodically. Correct, 100%. And, and they're only doing that maybe when there is an additional funding event, a fundraise. No, that's not true. Uh, technically, funds have a reporting requirement of how often they report to investors. Some do it annually, some do it quarterly, some do it daily. Um, it all depends on the under, what type of underlyings they are. So a real estate fund versus an equity fund will report NAV on a different schedule to but, their but investors. But aren't the, the share price of those underlying portfolio companies wouldn't necessarily change? Even if the fund is re, re It depends on what the underlyings are, but the, but but let's take it a step further, right? So if I'm a trader, and this is kind of the reason why we're right. talking about yeah. this, right? If I'm a trader trading hedge fund equity versus a trader trading corporate equity, I'm going to trade it completely differently because we all know how stocks are traded on the New York Stock Exchange, or even how crypto tokens are traded on decentralized exchanges or on Binance or anything. There's fancy robots making some recognition of liquidity, of uh, inputs and outputs, of aggression, right? We can define it however we want. And then you have fundamentalists that are actually making of, you know, it's overvalued, undervalued and stuff like that. But if I'm a trader trading hedge fund equity, I know what the NAV is. I don't necessarily care about the price, I only care about the premium or discount to the NAV. So the fact that the NAV is a known number and is a calculable number changes the game entirely. Because now my ability to trade that and to know where my profit lies means that I don't have to make a guesstimate on the, or I don't have to make an analytical valuation into what the value is, and the so, value so is let, known. Let's let's bring this back to what Black Moon does. So is yeah. your primary customer then hedge funds that are looking to tokenize to provide value added services to LPs? Correct, that would be one slice of the, of the Black Moon pie. Okay. Uh, that is one of the value propositions that we make to hedge funds. Is there a bigger one? Much bigger, much, much bigger. It, it starts at the hedge fund tokenization level. And it starts with the recognition that hedge fund equity is redeemable. And the recognition that that infrastructure that we've built and have been operational for over eight months now, I think eight months, something like that, since March. Is that eight months? I don't know, something like that. Um, that infrastructure has many legs to it as a really much, far, much larger, far-reaching strategy as it relates to creating redeemable asset tokens. So for example, today, uh, in addition to the hedge fund tokens, we also have uh, crypto strategies that we've listed on the platform. These in and of themselves are fund-based tokens that are just tracking a mandate as an index tracker, right? 
uh, by the way, technically they're Reg D exempt for U.S. investors. That U.S. investors can purchase those tokens. Would on that our be representative today. of all of your indexes that you offer? Correct. With Black Moon? Correct. All Correct. Retail investor eligible. Well, it depends if you're a U.S. investor or not. Uh, specifically and technically. Uh, the crypto strategy indexes that are listed on the platform today are Reg D exempt for accredited investors. So Black Moon has a full compliance KYC and AML onboarding procedure and so you, for you, all investors. Black Moon provides the exchange where customers can buy and sell these underlying tokens? Today, we are specifically only a creation and redemption platform. What tomorrow will bring, we can talk about it then. Okay, so as a, it sounds like an end-to-end -end service provider in this space. It's 100% what it is, and you asked me before, what's the difference between all those other companies? Uh, they each have their own value proposition, and I'm a, I'm a big fan and a proponent for all of those companies to succeed. Uh, they are certainly are not competitors to us in any way. In fact, uh, what, one of the, the main um, selling points that Black Moon and the products that I'm creating right now are what you would call a branded index, branded investable indexes. We call them ETX. Um, ETXs are branded aggregated asset tokens that are acting as a fund that house the curated set of underlyings that our partners choose, our branded partners choose. So, for example, so uh, if is this this is a sounds like a these bundles. That's like, what they are of, yeah. of and and they, there's a mandate. So there is a, a a mission that this bundle represents. That's exactly right. And it right. will invest in different portfolio companies Correct. to facilitate that mission. Correct. And, and we, it, the goal right. could be. Tokenized, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, tokenized minerals, right. or it could be that's exactly a, the a green, fund. the green fund. Right. But but think of it this way: uh, I'll give you a wacky example of how far this goes. Uh, I'm speaking to law firms that want to create their own investable index, and when I first started the conversation, I said, "Why would you want to do that?" I mean, I kind of prompted them to say that, but um, ultimately, it's for the brand and. It's not just about a marketing purpose. There's there's a real fundamental reason why this needs to happen, and it all comes down to liquidity. And, and on that point of liquidity, it's an interesting thing because we're talking about derivatives, which by right. their nature actually take liquidity away from the underlying. That's asset. a great point. How does this not do the same it's thing? It's a great, great, great point because this is not a derivative. The difference between a derivative product and an ETX is that we're actually asset-backed. So so when I trade the green fund, that's right. I'm actually trading the underlying that's right. companies. That's right, so so let's say you invested a million dollars in the green fund. Whereas, just for our listeners, yeah. that's not the case in the traditional ETF model, right? No, no, that is. Oh, it is that's also. the traditional ETF model, right? Uh, there, is, there are other ETP products, uh, exchange-traded products, that are credit-related, I don't want to get into the differences okay. between them. Um, that they're based on, you know, the mandates that the fund managers have to choose or not choose whether or not they want to trade the underlying. But technically, an ETF uh, traditionally has to have the underlines 100% asset backed, where the fund managers don't have a choice. I receive money as an investment. I am forced, based on the weightings of my mandate, to invest into the underlines, and that's. Liquidity provision number one, that the ETXs that we're providing uh, creates liquidity. So for example, in your green fund, if there is one solar energy company, ABC, okay, sun, sun panels are us, um, represent 10% of the fund. For every million dollars invested into the fund, $100,000 of it is forced to buy sun panels are us equity. So that is now bids and transactions that come to the marketplace that would otherwise not exist. Because that million dollar investor into the fund didn't even know necessarily that Sun Panels R Us exists. They just care about some diversification option of investing into green technology because they see a future in that, right? So 
Where, so, however, so is this where yeah. the arbitrage comes in? Ah, that's because second. That's a, that's another liquidity option. Okay. But we'll get maybe to we'll that. get to that on episode yeah. two. Of no, this we can interview. do. We can talk about that now. <laughs> uh, oh, of this episode. Okay, yeah. Okay, so no, the, the, so the, ding. <laughs> episode two begins now. I love how you just take control. I, I bet you do this with in, a, in every aspect of your life. No, and it causes gonna, you trouble. You're gonna scare but... away all my business development people. <laughs> you know, coming up. No. Uh, yeah. So let's let's get a little yeah. bit. Um, let's just talk about how we're actually driving liquidity into a market that desperately needs it. Where right. does the liquidity really come from? Okay. So bef- I have a, an exacting answer for you. Okay. But before I give you that. Let's first frame it with how it works today and why it's just a game. It's a video game right now. Today we have lots of market making market makers and liquidity providers that are fancy technologists and they come out with really fancy algorithms, but ultimately they're all taking risk. Because regardless of what their algorithms do or track, When the markets go down, they buy, buy, buy. And when the markets go up, they sell, sell, sell. And they require volatility to make money because they're just making money on the average spread of all the, well, the spread of the average buys and the average sells, right? So it's just a volume game for them. And without the volume, they don't make money. And without the volatility, they don't make money. And in fact, without volume and liquidity, they probably lose money. That's problem number one. That is just a fancy game of mathematics and information gathering and order routing. And it's just a technology game. And it's taking risk. The second part is cash. To be a market maker, you need cash. And to make markets in specific tokens or stocks or whatever it is that you're trading in, your money is being segmented out into the different markets that you're focused on. So the difference between me being able to support five markets versus 20 markets is the amount of money that I have as a market maker to distribute it across. So there's a limiting factor. And why would I take risk on that company right. versus another company? So the, the company that needs market making most may be the least likely to get it? Correct. Okay. That's It's completely upside down. Okay. And what's even crazier still is that that whole conversation becomes this self-fulfilling feedback loop right. of so what we, I'm a market maker and I, so I need to provide liquidity, but I only want to make markets on liquid Mis- markets. Misaligned incentives. So right, where, misaligned incentives. Where do we go from here? It all comes down to the ETX strategy. The ETX, as an aggregated asset token, provides a fungible arbitrage to entice traders and speculators to bid, to take risk in the form of bids and offers. It's the same bids and offers that they're taking now, but they're taking it for different reasons because they know that they can arbitrage against the ETX in real time. Now, what's important here is that these are bids and offers that would otherwise not exist without the ETX. Right, because the ETX is investing in a bundle but the individual assets in that bundle may be valued slightly different. Correct. So, so if I have a hundred thousand dollar investment in Green Fund, right. But that's driven. The growth is driven by one company. Other companies are benefiting from my hundred thousand dollar investment. That's that's the that's the liquidity provision that we talked about before. I'm mentioning something else right now, which is actually much more important. Is that as a trader, I can buy the underlines and sell the ETX and just keep those two that spread on my book and they go up and down in sync with each other. Now, I have a lot of ways of capturing that spread, whether the market flips or whether I can redeem the underlyings for the ETX token and vice versa. Why is the, why did the spread exist though between the It's uh, just the, math. the index It's just and a the mispricing. Underlying. It's a mispricing in the secondary market that is exist whether or not the ETX exists or not, because that's how secondary markets work. But really importantly is that the ETX provides a fungible arbitrage so that traders and speculators can take can so take that. We're risk. splitting this process of the evaluating opportunity and the trading. And we're Correct. saying Black Moon is exactly evaluating right. the opportunity for you. Now you can focus on your expertise, which is trading and getting that opportunity. Oh, I'm saying even better. 
the existence of the ETX says you don't need to evaluate these companies. You can just focus on the making the trade. Making the trade. So, so I'll I'll put it in a different way of thinking about it. We have this thing called a primary market and a secondary market. And a primary market where we're raising capital from investors, investors invest in companies that they believe that they're going to profit from in the future. And the mechanism of investing is to sit on it and wait, right? Or not, or make a profit or take a loss in the secondary market. But the secondary market is an engine that has its own set of rules. And the rule sets of the secondary market has nothing to do with investing. It has to do with trading. And without arbitrage, you don't have the tools to trade. And that's what's, I think, missing in the marketplace today, that you have investors being told that traders exist and being told that there's liquidity available for you, which I think is the value proposition of tokens versus traditional equity. Because if I invested into a company and traditionally a company would give me a piece of paper that my lawyer owns, and today instead I own a token. So there is a value proposition for proof of ownership, right? I own it, I can prove it, I don't have to pay fancy lawyers to go prove that I own equity. But if, I, if there's no liquidity for that token in some secondary market valuation, then aside from the proof of ownership, the difference between token and paper there's not much, much difference. Right. I might as well just give my money, own the paper sure, long term, sure. and just let the traditional market continue. 100% agree. So without liquidity, the concept of tokenization doesn't carry any more value than what traditionally exists right. already today. So and we need liquidity in order to make tokens work. And the only way you're going to get liquidity is to entice traders and speculators to take risk. And the only way you're going to get traders and speculators to take risk is to provide them arbitrageable opportunities to make trades and make transactions. So I'll, I'll say something. But, but here's the thing: is yeah. the arbitrage opportunities only exist if there are people trading that asset. So where where, ah. where do we get the people that right. are going to drive the that's, ultimate underlying liquidity? That's, that's the whole point. That that is a not a catch twenty two. It's just the opposite. It's a self fulfilling prophecy. That. The creation of the ETX allows you, as a trader, to create an arbitrage based on a mispricing. Because the ETX is redeemable, you know what the underlying value is in real time. And I can find the mispricing between the ETX's weighted value versus the underlyings and trade around that And the underlyings balance. are not redeemable? The underlyings are redeemable for the ETX, and the ETX is redeemable for the underlyings. That's what makes it fungible. And that's where the profit comes from, and from a trader's perspective, by creating a mispriced spread. And, and how, but by them creating the, 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 the device, or the, um, yeah. how are they creating a difference in price by investing in this? Because new I can buy the underlyings and sell the ETX. And technically speaking, on my exposure risk sheet, I've already sold those underlines that I purchased because my exposure to the risk of those underlines is now hedged. So you're just trading with yourself though, are you not? No, no, you're trading with a mechanism that allows you to redeem for value. And that's where the liquidity comes from. And if everybody redeems for value, then what? Is there a run on the bank situation? Like, how does it maintain sol solvency? It maintains solvency because the ETX is 100% asset backed. So, the difference between buying underlyings in the open market. So, let's say you didn't want to trade ETX. I mean, by the way, it's a great question. Okay, this I, is all very, very much more complicated than I was anticipating. <laughs> okay, so I accept the challenge because it's a great challenge question. Okay, but there is an answer. Let's say I wanted to manufacture, as a trader, my own portfolio. And I go out and I buy 10 tokens at different weightings that I decide. And now I'm going to trade those tokens, right? Because I created my own index that I want to track. And this is what people are doing today. Well, there is a difference if I buy $100,000 worth of it 
or a million dollars worth of it. Because when I flip out of it, I can't necessarily know that that liquidity is gonna be there for me when I wanna trade out of my million dollars. So there is a difference if I own 100,000, a million, or a hundred million dollars. Right. And by the way, that exists for stocks today, sure. Sure. and everybody knows it, and it's obvious. And if you look at the bids and offers and the volumes, right, don't necessarily look at the inside market of the price that's up there because the price can only be like one ether's worth of a buyer, whereas you know, the real liquidity is much, much lower. So when you look at a fair value price of a marketplace, you need to take the weighted average of lots of bids and offers to be able to gain you know, how much am I willing to invest in this. But instead, I can buy into an ETX, right? And I can buy into a fund knowing that that underlyings are 100% asset backed. Where when I redeem for the cash, right? And I want my money back, I don't have a limit of 100,000, a million, or 100 million dollars. So because I, I know that it's there, and I know what the value of the fund is, and I know I can redeem for that amount. So here's where the rubber meets the road. As a, as a, as a founder of a company, you want to sell security tokens to get a million dollars, let's say, for your first year. Of Correct. And now you have this device that allows you to get that from retail investors very easily. Right, right. But it's redeemable for cash. So if my investors come back and want their money back, and I've already spent half of it, then what? Well, you as a corporate equity CEO cannot do that, okay? You, you may have a buyback program that's part of your corporate docs. So maybe who in that is case. actually taking, who is actually redeeming it? Well, on, Black Moon handles all of that. And so Black Moon. Black Moon is supporting the entire life cycle of this entire and procedure. And how do you afford to do that? How, how that's the wrong word. Let's <laughs> rephrase that. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 but that's the kind of the question is how does Black Moon make money in this? In we, the, in we have very traditional fees related to the creation and the redemption of those tokens. And that's it. All right. Well, this has been very interesting. I, there's a lot that I have to now. Actually, I want to I want to I want to take I want to take you up on one thing you just brought up. That's okay. really important. We talked about the CEO who's going to raise capital by issuing some corporate equity token. The thing I want CEOs to hear on this podcast for me is that any token issuer, whether you're a platform, a CEO of a company that is thinking about this, if you're not focused on liquidity on behalf of your investors who are giving you money to invest in your company, you are either ignorant, negligent, or not prepared to issue a token into this environment. The key point here is that liquidity must be a requirement. It's a checkbox on the issuance of a token. And all those platforms that you mentioned earlier, I'm working with them to help create those liquidity provisions using a branded ETX on their behalf because they all understand, including the law firms, they all understand how the ETX token creates liquidity by enticing and incentivizing speculators and traders to enter the market for a fungible arbitrage. And they need it to help their clients issue a token because that token is only advantageous with the liquidity option. Beautiful. So for our CEOs and prospective CEOs out there, the thing you need to know is that the number one problem that you're not focusing on right now is how you're going to get liquidity for your investors. And talk to Moshe at Black Moon That's if right. you want to solve it. And for the Black Moon community, uh, the lesson here is that we have a lot of products live and operational. And quite frankly, I think we have the most. Uh, and we've been doing it the longest. And we're, I think, personally, the most prepared. I mean, some guys might say otherwise, which they do very vocally to me and I argue with them about it, you know, and we have, I have fun with that. But um, uh, I, I want the Black Moon community to learn and recognize that there's a much larger strategy at play here that the redemption paradigm and a redeemable token has a, a, another representation beyond what is on the platform today, uh, beyond the core product line of hedge fund tokenization and beyond the crypto strategies that we have live today. We, I am personally engaging with, actually with all those companies that you listed, I talked to all of them about creating a branded index, 
an in branded investable index on their behalf just to be help liquidity for those underlines that they're issuing. Love it. Great. Nice to meet Black you, Bijan. Moshe, uh, Crypto Invest Summit. Thank you Go very much. Go submit their podcast. This was uh, Black Moon, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing what they've got coming for us. Great. Thank you very much. That was our episode for today. Thank you to the Bitcoin Podcast Network for publishing and to our audience. Let us know what you think. Join our Slack. Hit us up on Twitter. We'll talk to you next time.